Welcome loyalists and restorationists to the Estudian Emerald tutorial. Estudian Emerald is a worker placement slash deck building game for two to five players. To start the game, we'll set out the game board and collect the specific nine cities and royalty cards. You can know which one those are because they have the name of each city that is on the board and the royalty cards are outlined in purple and have the name of the city also on the board. So you'll take each of the pairs and put them onto their respective slots. You'll be shuffling these up later, so the order in which you put them down does not matter. Once you've done that, you'll shuffle the remaining cards with the Cthulhu tentacle backgrounds. This is known as just the entire game deck. You'll shuffle them up, and depending on how many players you'll have, you'll place a certain number on each city pile. I'm going to set the game up for four players. So with four players, I'll put four cards each. If you're playing with two or three, you'll place three cards each. If you're playing with five, you'll place five cards each. Before you place them, make sure to flip all the city cards. That was just to make sure that you had them in the right places. Now that we know that, we can shuffle our deck and place the appropriate number of cards based on the number of players. Once you've added the appropriate number of cards, the remaining cards are not used for the rest of the game. You will then shuffle each city pile and flip the top card over. If when flipping over cards you reveal the royalty card of that city, you will instead take that card, place it under the city pile, and then flip a new card over. After you've set up all the card piles, you will then take the two black trackers and place them onto the zero spots of the loyalist and restorationist factions. Then each player takes a color and takes all associated pieces with it. The pieces that you get are 10 agents, 10 influence cubes, and one victory point tracker. They also get the starting deck associated with that color. Each starting deck is the same 10 cards, but the deck associated with your color is the one that has the same color background. So in this example, all these cards are the green deck, all these cards are the purple deck, blue, red. After you've gotten all your pieces and cards, you will take five of your influence cubes and place them onto this part of the board that is called Limbo. These cubes are unavailable for you at the very start of the game, but you have options to take them out. Everyone will then take their victory point marker and place it on the zero spot of the victory point tracker. Each player will shuffle their starting deck of 10 and draw five cards. But we're not ready to play just yet. You will then shuffle the confidential identity markers or identity cards and deal one to each player. The possibilities for these cards is loyalist and restorationist. Throughout the game you'll be collecting victory points. Either neutral victory points, loyalist victory points, or restorationist victory points. But the ones you care about are the ones associated with your faction. So it's possible that you could be collecting victory points of the other team, but you'll suffer a penalty for it by the end of the game. Although there are two factions in this game, there can only be one winner. So how you bluff your way through and getting other people to aid you or sabotage others is really up to you. But you deal one of these cards to each player and then you'll take three sanity tokens and place it on top of that card. Each player will look at their identity, place the three tokens on top of their card, and lastly, will randomly determine who is first player. You can do this any number of ways, however you decide. Once you pick first player, that player will take one of their agent tokens and place it onto a city. They can place it on any city, and each subsequent player can place their tokens on any city that already has an agent or one of their own agents. There is no limit to how many tokens can be on a single city. So we'll just go around, placing tokens, until each player has placed two. Lastly, you'll simply place the zombie and the sandy dice within easy reach of everyone in case they come up within the game. And now you're ready to play. So each card will have a certain number of symbols on the top of its card. These denote the specific actions you can take. Once you learn what these actions do, 
you can then chain them for better results. Just an example here, one of the most simple actions that you'll be performing is the place influence action. That is denoted by the square with the blue arrow pointing down, which is different from the take influence action, which is the square with the red arrow pointing up. So the basic form of this card is you place these cards in front of you saying, I'm performing this action. When you decide to do an action, you are doing either or of the symbols on the card. As you can see on the board here, there are multiple cards with multiple actions on them. You're still only picking one of those actions to perform. So the most basic form of place influence, if I only play one, I will take one influence from my stack, which is my available pile, and place it onto any city, just like that. If I were to discard multiple cards with the same icon, I can do it that many times. So if I here discard three cards with the place influence cube, I can then place three influence cubes. However, they must all be placed at the same city. Just like that. During your turn, you can perform two actions. So I just finished the re resolution of performing the place influence action. As my second action, I could perform the take influence action. So to do that, I would take influence cubes from different locations. I could take it from a city, I could take it from limbo, I could take one from the city and one from limbo. It's up to you. But of course, seeing as this is the start of the game, the smarter idea is to take two from limbo. And now they are in my available stack to be used in subsequent turns. After you've completed your turn, which is performing two actions, you would then draw from your own deck and bring your hand back up to five. If you've exhausted your deck and need to draw more cards than you have available, you reshuffle your discard pile and break it into your new deck. Now before we go into details about all the specific actions you can perform, let me just say that you cannot perform actions or you cannot discard more cards than you necessarily have. For example, let's say I only had one influence cube left in my available pile and I want to discard these three cards to do the place influence cube action. I can't do that. I only have one available, so I can only play one to do that action. I can't discard more cards than I can fulfill. And that rule remains true for every action. If you cannot perform that action that many times as cards as you are discarding, you cannot discard that many cards. So let's go through all the actions now. I mentioned, place influence cube, take influence cubes from your stack, place them onto a single city. Discard multiple cards to do multiple influence cubes onto the same city. Claim a card. It is the blue icon, the blue card icon that says first on it. This action is unique because it must be the first action of your turn. It cannot be the second. So as a first action, you will claim a card from a city that you have the most tokens at. And these tokens can be any combination of agents and influence cubes. However, you must have at least one influence cube. So if we're going to do an example here, the red player cannot claim a card from the Rome stack. He has two influence, he has two tokens here and the blue player has two tokens here. The green player could take one card from the Cairo stack because he has the most tokens at the city and one of them is at least an influence cube. For example here, the Berlin player could not take, or the red player could not take a card from Berlin. Even though they have the most tokens at the city, none of them are influence cubes. So that's how claiming a card works. And if you discard multiple cards that have the claim card action, you can claim multiple cards from different cities as long as it still fulfilled the requirements of you have the most tokens at it and one of them is an influence cube. The third action you can perform is taking influence cube. As I mentioned, you can take influence cubes from either cities or from Limbo and place it into your available stack. Unlike placing influence cubes, they can come from multiple different sources and they all go to your stack. The fourth action you can perform is Move Agent, which is the latter. Move Agent is very simple. You take an agent from one city and move it to another. 
if you place multiple move agents, you can take multiple agents and move them onto different cities. They don't have to all come from the same city, you're simply moving one agent from one city to another. Just like that. The next action you can perform is advancing the victory point tracker of a specific faction. In this example here, the loyalist will go up by one. So if during your turn you decide I want to advance the faction tracker by this many number, and if you chain it with multiple cards that have the same effect, the numbers stack. So this one has two and the other one had one. If I were to place them both down, I would move the tracker up by three. Just like that. When the faction trackers move, every player will gain a certain number of victory points equal to the difference of the two trackers here. It's also possible to place cards that have the influence tracker movement action on it from different factions. They don't both have to be of the same color. You could do a green one move forward and a purple one move forward and they would both go up simultaneously. But as I mentioned, you will take the difference and add them to every player's victory point totals. And that sounds weird because some of these players may not be of that faction. And this is where some of the spy work kind of goes into play. You don't know necessarily who's winning and by how much. At the end of the game, you'll then determine really what your actual point values is. This is more of an estimate, but the game still ends when one player reaches the victory point total required for your number of players currently playing. But we'll get into that at the very end of the game. That is how the move marker action works. And this happens every time you move the marker. If the next player were to move it again, the difference is now four and you'll increase everyone's victory points to mark the difference. If someone were to move up the other one, the difference is now two, they'll move it up only two. The next action is to perform an assassination. The assassination is denoted by the marker here on the top left, and it is possible to perform multiple assassinations, but it gets kind of tricky and I'll explain why. To perform an assassination, it's almost the opposite of influence cubes, which is like the uh, take card action. So to perform an assassination, you are assassinating either another agent or the Eldritch royalty card of that city if it has been revealed. For example here, Vienna has revealed their royalty Eldritch Horror. So you could send agents to that location to assassinate that royalty card. Or you can simply assassinate other agents onto the, on the board. So to perform assassination, you must have the most tokens at that city and at least one of them must be an agent. But that's not all you need to do. You must also discard a number of bomb icons equal to either the number denoted on the royalty card. Here you need five or the number denoted on the city itself. Here at Berlin, it also says 5. Vienna says 4. Rome says 3. Cairo says 2. And the card you discard cannot be the card that you play to perform the action. So if playing this card, I cannot discard that same card to have it count for its bomb icon. I must discard a different card. Luckily, however, each agent you have at a city counts as a number of bomb icons. Each agent is worth one bomb icon. So for example here the Berlin player has three. If I were to discard another card that's four and if I were just to have this agent there that would be five and I would have successfully assassinated an agent at this city. When you do that you first look at the card that you used to initiate the assassination. If it has this icon here at the bottom, it means that if the agent you assassinated was a Restorationist, you will gain three Loyalist victory points. So you'll take their agent, place it off to the side on top of the assassination card. When you perform the assassinate action, the card that you use to initiate the action is discarded from the game entirely. It doesn't go back into your discard to be reshuffled. It goes away. 
and if you perform an assassination with an icon specific like this one at the bottom it goes away but it's just off to the side to mark that if the blue if the green player here is a restorationist a loyalist will get three victory points and you would score those victory points now this red player here would move their tracker up one two three everyone else stays back but at the end of the game if it turns out they weren't a loyalist or if it turns out that the green player that they assassinated was not a restorationist they would go back three because they did not rightfully gain those victory points but we're getting back into the how the scoring of this game works but every time that you claim victory points whether it's neutral restorationist or loyalist you'll still go up that number of victory points it's only at the end of the game do you determine whether or not do you rightfully claim those victory points towards your victory if you assassinate an agent at a city at that specific city will show you how many victory points you claim and how many spaces you move the loyalist or restorationist tracker some cities don't have that tracker movement but most do so in this example the red player would not only claim the three he got from using this specific assassination card but he would also claim the five from doing an assassination at berlin and then he would move the loyalist tracker up two and now we have to subtract the diff or we have to find out the difference again and move every player up by that much one two three four four so a lot of victory points can happen in one fell swoop but if this again once we get towards the end of the game if this player doesn't happen to be of that faction they could end up getting their victory point total reduced by an exponential amount but oh well if you assassinate a eldritch royalty card it shows you how many victory points you get if you are of that faction toward the end of the game but you still score those points now and then you must roll the sanity dice sanity dice here is a simple unique dice you roll it and if you get that symbol you will take one of your sanity tokens off of your identity card if you ever lose all of your sanity tokens on your card you must reveal what your identity is and depending on which identity you have the game could end immediately or you could regain agents onto the field since we're talking about the identity cards right now i should also mention that if you happen to lose all agents you control on the board you must then also reveal your identity so if another player or red again were to go down here and remove green's last agent on the board green must then reveal their identity even though they still had sanity tokens on their card so then that goes into what the symbol here at the top means and this is victory points if it's red or if it's purple it'll give you that many restorationist points at the end of the game if it's green that will give you loyalist if it's black it is neutral remember when you claim these cards you still gain that many victory points just like that it's at the end of the game that will determine whether or not you keep it however this is not an action you can't perform this multiple times and this is a royalty card so this doesn't go into your deck proper when you defeat a royalty eldritch horror you simply place it off to the side of your play area and you'll score it at the end of the game when claiming a card some cards may have this symbol here at the top this means after you claim this card place an agent at the city in which you claimed it so if i were to claim this card boop as the green player i can place an agent from my pile onto that city and those represent all the symbols on the cards so the last actions you can do are discard your cards if you have a hand that you don't want as an action you can discard one or more cards from your hand to your discard pile but you do not pick up anymore this is probably something you want to do as your second action after you perform your first or you just decide oh i don't have anything i want in my hand i'm just going to discard my cards so that when i end my turn i'll draw back up to five hopefully getting new cards that are not as bad 
There are also actions denoted on the card information text proper. Here you can see this card has a one use action. So as an action you can perform this. And it says replace an agent of your choice with one of your own city you occupy or interrupt negate assassination of one of your agents. So one use means you can only use it once. After you use it this card gets discarded from the game entirely. Free action. A free action, it doesn't cost one of your actual actions, and you can perform it at any point during your turn. But once you use that action, you discard that card. And lastly, you can pass. You say, I'm done with my turn. I don't want to do anything else. I pass. And the turn moves over. So that is everything the game has in terms of mechanics. Lastly, is how you win and how you score points. So, as you saw, there are many different ways to score neutral or specific faction victory points. Regardless of which faction you are, whenever you take those cards or perform those actions, you gain that many victory points. So like I said, if this was how things are. If a player reaches the victory point total or beyond, required for the number of players that you have, in this case four, the game ends. If one of the victory point trackers move up to the space 10, the game ends. If a player is revealed to be a restorationist, the game ends immediately. So that's three ways for the game to end. Once the game is over, every player will look at their deck and they will find all the cards that say whether or not they got a specific faction's victory points. So everyone will then reveal their proper identities and then you will score your points. So loyalist and restorationist players keep the proper victory points of their faction. So here, if the green player claimed this card, he would not lose five victory points because he is a restorationist. And if the red player here was a loyalist, which he is not, he will still lose three victory points. Even though the player whom he assassinated was a restorationist. It's because he's not a loyalist, he doesn't claim those victory points. So he'll go back down three. You do this with all the cards of your specific faction. You keep the ones of your faction, you lose the ones that you don't deserve. And then you will look at these trackers here. Whoever is on the side that has the highest, so in this case, the loyalist, nothing will happen to their victory point totals. However, the players of the losing faction will lose the difference. So in this example here, 10, 2, the two restorationist players will lose 8 victory points. Finally, after making all those adjustments, Whoever has the lowest score, in this case, the green player. All players of that faction, of the lowest player, will lose 5 victory points. In case of a tie, the loyalist player will be considered to be the lowest scoring player. And now, after you've made that final adjustment, whoever is on top is the winner. In this case, the purple player has won the game after all the adjustments have been made so just because you're gathering victory points you have to be sure to gather your own while trying to increase your factions tracker here and even help the people who are on your side or who you suspect to be on your side because losing five points is a lot of points to lose and this game can go pretty fast you can see that some of these cards here they just give you an automatic increase of five and if people are moving this tracker up very quickly every player is going to be moving up forward so if some player just sprints to the first victory point to end the game you might not have that many chances left to win but even if you reach that threshold and after calculating all the victory points you go below that threshold the game's still over you're now just scoring victory points to determine who's properly won. 
but that is how you play a study in Emerald. If you have any questions, feel free to send me a tweet at cynicallyawesome minus the E, or send me an email at cynicallyawesomegames at gmail.com. That's it, and thanks for watching.